heard about PCR biosystems? There's quite a buzz about us. Hop on over to our website to find out more. Hello, hello, and welcome back, everybody, to Pints of Science from the city of Portsmouth. Again, I'm your host, Kyle Marson, and I hope you enjoyed our two previous nights. And tonight is going to be equally fantastic with some absolutely brilliant speakers, including Professor David Martil, Dr. Nizar Ibrahim, and Roy Smith. And before we get into the show tonight, I again do have to mention that feedback form. Tell us what you enjoyed about our shows, any feedback you can give to us. And then with that feedback form, you'll be put into a prize draw on the Pint of Science Twitter homepage and could be within the chance of winning some excellent prizes and merchandise. So with all that done and out of the way, let's not delay any longer. Let's get into the show with our first speaker tonight, Professor David Martill. Now, Professor Martil is a professor of paleobiology and is a vertebrate paleontologist and lecturer at the University of Portsmouth. And he deals with a whole range of research, including dinosaurs, insects, oysters, and something that takes up a lot of his time, pterosaurs, the winged reptiles of the Mesozoic. He's also been involved in expeditions to North Africa for over 20 years, and is a supervisor to undergraduate students and master students like myself, and PhD students who've gone on to do field work at uh, such areas as Morocco, Europe, Brazil, and the United States. So let's not delay any longer. Take it away, Professor Martil. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I don't know whether Kyle's mentioned that he's working on some Moroccan fossils, but he, he certainly is. Um, so um, my colleagues have given me the job of introducing you to uh, a locality that we've been working on now for uh, about 20 years, uh, which has been yielding some fantastic fossils. And in fact, Morocco is probably one of the best places in the world for fossils. So my colleagues, you're going to see them as soon as I've finished. And I'm just going to do the nuts and bolts and tell you a little bit about the rocks that form what we are calling a river of giants. And this river of giants formed a huge swathe of strata that we call today the Chem Chem group, and they are of Cretaceous age. And this was, of course, a very, very long time ago, uh, around about 100 million years. And this huge river system drained the interior of the African continent. The best place to see these strata is in southeast Morocco, very, very close to the border with Algeria in an area known as the Tafilalt. But Africa was nothing like the continent that it is today. It was even larger. It was joined to South America in a big supercontinent known as Gondwana. And at around about 100 million years ago, this continent started to break up. And there was much uh, highlands in the south or in the central part of Africa. And these uh, had rivers, some of which drained south. But one of them, the Kemkem Kem River, drained north all the way to a newish ocean called the Tethys Ocean, which was a bit of the Indian Ocean that was propagating towards the West and separated Africa from Europe. The environment is difficult to interpret, but likely it was a huge, big, meandering and braided stream, lots and lots of river channels, distributaries and tributaries. And this picture, which is taken from the Batsiboka River in uh, Madagascar is probably what the Kemkem Kem may have looked like if you could visualize it as a satellite image. And the red color of the river here is highly likely to be the same as the Kemkem, Kem, where all of the strata that it produces are reddish in color. The rocks that now form the Kemkem Kem group form a beautiful tableland in the Tafilalt region of the Sahara Desert. And these uh, tablelands 
are made up of hard beds, very often hard sandstones, and the very top one, a limestone, and softer beds underneath, and these are all fossiliferous. This is a mountain called Garaspar, and we've had some of our best fossils from this locality. Now, I mentioned that these rocks are around about 100 million years old, but actually the dating is really rather poor, and we're not very precise about it. The very, very top layer is a limestone which we've dated very well. It's Cenomanian, and so therefore around about 90 million years old. But the strata that we're getting our best fossils from are a little bit older, but we don't know by how much. They're not Jurassic. They're certainly from the early Cretaceous, but maybe from the bottom part of the late Cretaceous. So I put a little circle around there to sort of show you the age that the rocks are likely to be. So it's a little bit embarrassing that we've got a slop of around about 20 million years, but we have to live with that at the moment. But a nice number to remember, 100 million years is approximately the age of these strata. Now, this little diagram on the right-hand side shows the main stratigraphic layers that we collect fossils from. On the very top of the plateau, there is a limestone. This is a marine limestone with ammonites uh, and some marine reptiles and fishes in it. But the chem, chem beds underneath it are divided into two formations, the Alphus formation and the Ifazuan. This is what the Acrobu formation looks like. And there's lots and lots of little fossil fishes and ammonites in these. The Acrobu formation overlies these reddish mudstones and siltstones of the Alphus formation. And mostly we find very, very few fossils here. They're a little bit rare in this layer, uh, except that at the junction with the bed underneath, uh, we did actually come across um, the skeleton of a Spinosaurus, the first to be found for about 100 years. And Nizar will talk to you about Spinosaurus. And this formation underneath is the Ifazuan formation. And this is where we're getting most of our fossils from. Uh, here's Roy standing next to one of the fossiliferous layers. Most of the rock you see there will be barren of fossils, but there are some thin horizons that are absolutely stuffed with bones and teeth of dinosaurs and crocodiles and fishes and all sorts of other things as well. And in this region, lots of local people mine these fossils, especially the teeth of Spinosaurus, which, of course, they sell. These mines are particularly dangerous places, very difficult places to work. Uh, and they can go into the rock for maybe 100 metres or even more. And here is a day's worth of fossil collecting from the miners. This is in a, a beautiful little oasis town of Begar, right near the Algerian border. And you can see these are the fossils that the miners have dug that day. And just a, a quick uh, glance through uh, the, what they found. You can see that there's a, a Spinosaurus tooth there, the scoot of a crocodile, uh, a part of the rostrum of a, of a sawfish, um, a, another type of shark called a hybodont shark, its fin spine is there, um, some more teeth of the rostrum, a part of a coelacanth, and there's even a dinosaur tailbone in there. So that's quite a haul for a day's work. Now, the problem with this material is we are just getting the chicken bones. We're getting the scraps. This is what we're getting. We are not getting articulated skeletons, but the material that we are getting is nonetheless extremely important scientifically. But why are we getting the scraps though? Well, rivers are really rather dangerous places to be. Very often animals fall into rivers. Um, this has got a good story. The mother comes along and rescues this elephant, but they can act as traps for animals. Rivers flood and they will drown herds of animals that were living on the floodplain. Animals have to migrate across rivers. And of course, that can be treacherous and they get predated by crocodiles. All of these remains, they get scavenged by the likes of vultures and pulled to pieces. And hyenas today might even take pieces of way to their lairs to be devoured. And that means that all of the animals around this river system were being eaten, being scavenged, being dragged away, and we are left with the leftovers. But I'd like you to imagine that this croc, of which there are plenty in the Kem Kem River system, this croc, instead of having a bird in its mouth, has 
a pterosaur. And here's Roy. And what, we's, what Roy is doing here, he's going through a box of scraps. And look at those fossils in there. Uh, they are a bit rough. But believe it or not, there are some little gems in there. And they are preserved beautifully and three-dimensionally. And we can get a lot of information from them. Now, what my colleagues have let me do, uh, they won't let me talk about the dinosaurs or the pterosaurs. They let me talk about the fish. And every big river system on our planet today has a big fish in it. But the Kem Kem River had many big fish. And I can't talk about them all. I don't have time. But I will just mention these five river monsters. Number one, two, three, four, and five. Here's number one. This is a fish called Lepidotes. And we now know that this was getting up to 2.5 meters. And it's found by these big scales, these beautiful, shiny, enamel-coated scales. We find hybridont sharks. We find their fin spines. And we find these little cephalic spines. And this was a, a river shark that got up to two meters. There was also a saw shark there. In fact, this was actually a very common fish. And whilst mostly they probably got to five or six meters, there are some bits and pieces that suggest they maybe even got to eight meters. Um, and here's a typical scene from uh, the Fitzroy River in Western Australia, which is almost identical to what was happening in the Kem Kem. Here, a big croc has taken hold of a freshwater sawfish. There are lungfish in here as well. And here we can see the dental plates with these great big serrations on these dental plates. And these lungfishes were getting to a perhaps two meters long. And finally, there was a monster of a coelacanth. Coelacanths today, very, very rare, but they live in the deeper parts of the ocean. In the Kem Kem River system, there was a gigantic coelacanth called Malsonia. And this is the one that we find very commonly. And it was getting to four or maybe even more meters. Now, those fishes were big enough. They were monsters of this river. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass you on to Roy and to Nizar, and they are going to tell you about the real monsters that lived by this Kem Kem River system. Oh, thank you very much for that, uh, Professor Artil. Um, I hope we've got some excellent questions for you in the Q&A session at the end of our show. And I'd like to get everyone to do a quick round of applause in the comments section for Professor Martil. So thank you very much, uh, Dave. We'll see you in the Q&A later. So thank you very much. And we're going to move on to our next speaker tonight. So on to our next speaker, Dr. Nizar Ibrahim. Now, Dr. Nizar Ibrahim is another vertebrate paleontologist and lecturer at the University of Portsmouth. But he's also a natural, uh, National Geographic explorer and TED fellow. He's also done expeditions to North Africa's Sahara Desert, looking into the different fossil assemblages there. And his research is around pterosaurs, dinosaur trackways, and giant predatory dinosaurs, with some of those even being featured in National Geographic, Nature, Science, and the New York Times. But he's also particularly passionate about science and exploration by using speaking events like tonight, uh, ex exhibitions and documentaries to communicate science to the general public, other scientists and other colleagues. So take it away, Dr. Ibrahim. All right. Thanks so much. So as you uh, found out in uh, the previous presentation, the Sahara, a huge desert the size of the United States, is a pretty incredible place um, if you're looking for fossils. It's a real treasure trove. You can find uh, giant fish, you can find crocodile-like hunters, flying reptiles, and of course, dinosaurs. And so what I'd like to do today is I'd like to introduce you to uh, the most famous Saharan dinosaur, a creature called Spinosaurus. Um, in fact, this is probably the most bizarre dinosaur out there, full stop. And I have sometimes described this creature as a paleontology's holy grail. So our story begins with a, a pioneering German paleontologist, Ernst Stromer. Um, Stromer was a, an accomplished scientist um, and a, a great zoologist and geologist. And he decided to scour the shifting sands of the Sahara in search of fossils of little mammals. 
that's what he was really trying to find. And he described many incredible mammal fossils over the years. Um, but tonight, uh, I would like to focus on his final expedition to the Sahara. And uh, on that final expedition in 1911, he came across something very different. He found giant bones of dinosaurs in the Sahara. And it was uh, really one of the first um, brief glimpses we got of um, Africa's age of dinosaurs. Uh, he sent his fossil collector, Richard Markgraf, back to these fossil-rich localities. And Markgraf sent several partial skeletons of dinosaurs back to Munich in Bavaria, in southern Germany, where Stromer was based. And one of these dinosaurs really stands out. It's a giant predatory dinosaur, a creature Stromer described and, and named in 1915. The name means spined lizard for obvious reasons. Spinosaurus has big, tall spines on its back. And these spines form a beautiful, uh, majestic sail on the back of this animal. Some of these spines are as tall as a person. Um, Stromer also described a strange, slender lower jaw with conical teeth a little bit like the lower jaw of a crocodile. So this was a very strange animal. Stromer did not have a, a complete skeleton. Uh, in fact, he only had a few um, well-preserved bones, and those are the bones you can see highlighted here in, in a, a darker color. Um, but he knew that this was something very unusual. And he suspected that this animal may have been even larger than T. rex, which had only recently described, uh, been described from North America. So Stromer had uncovered this incredible world of dinosaurs in the Sahara, and he found this huge, uh, monstrous predator. So um, his career was, was going very well at the time, but uh, Stromer lived in, in dangerous times. And when World War II erupted, Stromer's life took a dramatic turn. Stromer was a, an outspoken critic of the Nazi dictatorship. And he was very worried about uh, the things that were happening uh, all across Europe. Um, he was also very worried about his fossils because in the 1940s, Allied forces had started uh, bombing major cities throughout Germany. And so many of the big museums were moving their scientific collections to, to safe locations outside of the major metropolitan areas. And so Stromer lobbied the director of the Munich Museum which at the time was one of the best natural history museums in the world, um, he lobbied him to have his fossils moved to a safe location outside of Munich. But the director of the museum, an ardent Nazi supporter, refused. And he said that the museum would not be targeted and that the fossils would be safe. Um, but in April 1944, uh, a Royal Air Force air raid did target many buildings um, in the old city of Munich including the Natural History Museum. And the entire museum was, was destroyed and the bones of Spinosaurus were pulverized, reduced to rubble. Um, and so Stromer lost many of his incredible discoveries in a single night and the bones of Spinosaurus were lost, seemingly forever. So this is a very dramatic background story and um, at a relatively young age, I decided that I was going to essentially follow in Stromer's footsteps. I wanted to return to North Africa and I wanted to rediscover these lost worlds of Saharan dinosaurs. And so over the last um, 12 years or so, I led several expeditions to the Sahara and we uncovered thousands of fossils, including some really spectacular pieces, um, bones of large plant-eating dinosaurs, um, jaws of crocodile-like predators. Um, and we essentially resurrected uh, a really bizarre ancient world, uh, a world dominated by predators. Um, you'll hear about the, the giant predatory flying reptiles in a moment. Uh, we found lots of remains of big predatory dinosaurs, crocodile-like hunters, predatory fish. It was a very dangerous place. Very few plant-eating dinosaurs. And so, um, this obviously begs the question, well, what did a giant predator like Spinosaurus feed on? Um, and uh, you'll see that Spinosaurus did something very unusual and very interesting in a moment. So I'll just show you a, a, a reconstruction of this ancient uh, river system. You know, if we were to travel back in time, 
we wouldn't see this desert landscape. This is the desert today. We would see uh, a vast river system teeming with life. We would see all the giant fish you just saw in the previous presentation. You would also see um, flying reptiles soaring through the skies. Um, and of course, dinosaurs walking around the edge of this ancient river system. It's a very, very different place from the Sahara today. But of course, the question you're all asking is, well, what about Spinosaurus? Did you describe and, and excavate a new skeleton of Spinosaurus? People have tried to find a new skeleton of Spinosaurus for decades. Um, and we were extremely fortunate we were able to track down a Spinosaurus locality. And uh, we revealed a partial skeleton of this animal to the world in 2014. And we were able to confirm that this was an enormous predator, about 15 meters in length. That's quite a bit longer than um, the longest T-Rex. But that's not the most interesting thing about Spinosaurus. The most interesting thing about Spinosaurus is its bizarre anatomy. We now know that Spinosaurus had long slender jaws with conical teeth, which is a very unusual skull shape for a dinosaur. Um, but this is something you see in animals that hunt for prey in the water. If you have narrow jaws, you can close your jaws very rapidly underwater. There's very little water resistance. You can also see that the nose opening of Spinosaurus is kind of pushed back. It's not at the tip of the snout like in other predatory dinosaurs. Um, so we suggested that this was essentially a river monster, a water-loving dinosaur. Um, and that was a, a pretty controversial uh, idea and suggestion because it challenged decade-old dogma, which essentially said that dinosaurs just never invaded the aquatic world. We used to think of dinosaurs as land-dwelling animals, and we assumed that they never really invaded the watery world. Um, one problem we did have was that we didn't really have a, a plausible motor that would propel this animal through the water. Um, so we, we uh, returned to the dig site, and in 2018 and 2019, we found something pretty incredible. We had to remove many, many tons of rock under very difficult conditions in uh, you know, very hot temperatures. Um, but we were determined to, to find out if maybe we could find other parts of the Spinosaurus skeleton we had been working on. And when we hit the bone bearing layer, it was the jackpot. We found bone after bone after bone. And what we found essentially was the back half of Spinosaurus. Uh, we found about 80% of the tail of Spinosaurus. And the tail of Spinosaurus was so bizarre, so unexpected. It was a massive surprise because it turns out that this dinosaur had a paddle like tail. So this paddle-like tail would have propelled this animal through the water. Um, no other dinosaur has a tail like this. Um, so this was kind of the missing piece in our story. We now understood how this animal was moving through the water. So there's really no doubt that this was a, a river monster actively pursuing prey in the water. In fact, even if you look at the inside structure of the bones of Spinosaurus, you can see telltale signs for this lifestyle. What you're looking at here are sections through the femur or the thigh bone of um, uh, several birds and dinosaurs. And one of the things you see is that typically um, there's a large opening in the middle of the thigh bone, the medullary cavity. But if you look at the bone in Spinosaurus, it's really, really dense. And dense bone like this is something we see in animals like manatees, for example. We see these adaptations in water-dwelling animals. The dense bone is important in buoyancy control. So this wasn't an animal that was just kind of wading in the shallows and trying to catch fish on the margins of rivers. This was an animal that really spent a substantial amount of time in the water, and it had this specialized anatomy. It wasn't just occasionally swimming from one spot to the next. You know, most dinosaurs could do that if they had to. No, this was a specialized, um, largely aquatic predator. And uh, I would like to, to now kind of take you on a journey back in time to, to really show you the incredible world of Spinosaurus using the power of science and animation. Um, so let's just dive into the mesmerizingly beautiful world of Spinosaurus for a few seconds.
So piecing together uh, a giant predator like Spinosaurus is extremely challenging. Um, there's nothing alive today that looks anything like Spinosaurus. And even in the world of dinosaurs, there's no blueprint for a creature like Spinosaurus. Um, it, it really kind of breaks the mold. And so the Spinosaurus project was an international project and it involved scientists from many different disciplines. Um, and not just scientists, I also work very closely with animators and artists, artists like Davide Bonadonna here. David is an incredible paleo artist and he created all of the artwork um, you saw in, in this presentation. Um, so it's really a multidisciplinary effort um, and it's still ongoing. Um, I can just give you a, a kind of sneak preview of uh, this flesh model of Spinosaurus. We're going to reveal a new flesh model of this incredible dinosaur in uh, uh, the not too distant future. Um, it's going to be revealed uh, in southern Germany. Um, and we're working on a number of other exciting projects. So I can tell you that um, there's a lot more to come. We have several very exciting Spinosaurus related publications and projects in the pipeline. Um, so we're going to reveal many more incredible things about this awe-inspiring, uh, majestic, beautiful, uh, lost giant of the Sahara. So stay tuned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Ibrahim. Hopefully we've got some questions from our viewers tonight about Spinosaurus and we'll try and get to them in the Q&A session. But thank you very much. And can we get a round of applause in the comments section for Dr. Ibrahim? And we'll move on to our next and final speaker of tonight. So thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. So moving from the water, we're going to head into the skies with our next speaker tonight, Roy Smith. Now, Roy is a PhD student at the University of Portsmouth, and he actually did his undergraduate degree at the University of Portsmouth with a dissertation looking into carboniferous sharks of Derbyshire. He'd then go on to do a master's degree at the University of Southampton, looking into the microware of teeth of dinosaurs. And now he's in his final year of a PhD looking into the taphonomy and preservation of pterosaurs in the Kem Kem group of Morocco and comparing those with other pterosaur bearing deposits. So everyone strap in. We're about to take off with pterosaur airlines with your captain, Roy Smith. Roy, take it away. Thanks, Carl. That was great. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about the Kem Kem group pterosaurs, as Carl mentioned. But to start with, I'm going to introduce you to what pterosaurs are. So pterosaurs are a group of flying reptiles that first evolved in the late Triassic about 225 million years ago and went extinct along with the dinosaurs about 66 million years ago. Pterosaurs are not dinosaurs, but we do think they are closely related. Now pterosaurs were the first group of vertebrates to achieve powered flight well before birds or bats even evolved. But like bats, pterosaurs fly using a wing membrane supported by an elongated finger. Unlike bats, pterosaurs only support this wing membrane with a single elongated finger, opposed to the whole hand, as you can see here. Now, pterosaurs are incredibly diverse in their 160 million year long range. And they, uh, as you can see from these uh, different uh, skull morphologies, occupied a range of different uh, niches, ecological niches, and occupied a load of different diets. Uh, we can see from this diagram, they both had uh, toothed uh, forms and toothless forms. Both are found in the Kem Kem group. Now, uh, the tooth forms are called onphocyroids in the Kem Kem and uh, the toothless ones are called the asdarkoids. Now, I'm going to run through each of these uh, species that are found in the Kem Kem and tell you a little bit about each. So I'll start with the tooth pterosaurs. So these include Clobrinchus, Cyracopteryx, Ananguera, 
and on Vicarious. Now, all of these uh, differ slightly in their uh, skull and jaw morphologies uh, and also in their tooth placement, but all of them have long conical teeth ideal for catching fish. And that's exactly what we think these animals did. As Dave mentioned earlier, fish were incredibly common in the Kemkem River, uh, so these didn't have any shortage of food to eat. Now, these tooth pterosaurs are not that common in the Kemkem. We only have about 10 jaw fragments, uh, opposed to the toothless pterosaurs, which are far more common and we know a little bit more about. So these include a Lanka, which had a long, straight beak, uh, Afrotapijara, which had a downturned upper jaw, similar to that of a toucan, a Pateramphus, which had a wedge-shaped head, Leptostermia, Leptostermia, which had a long, slender beak, uh, and we think was a probe feeder, but I'll get onto that later, and Zoocips, which had an upturned jaw. Now, we think most of these animals, apart from Leptostermia, also ate fish, but they probably also uh, fed on carrion and other small invertebrates as well. Uh, Alanka, in particular, has a bony uh, protuberance towards the back of its jaw, uh, which protrudes down into its jaw, which was perfect for crushing hard food items like crustaceans or perhaps even vert vertebrates like uh, turtles. Now, the Kemkem pterosaurs are not preserved how you'd expect them to be, how everyone thinks we find these uh, these bones, uh, like this one from the Solnhofen limestone of Germany. This one is called Pterodactylus. They are not uh, preserved like this, where the whole skeleton is preserved, articulated, and where we can see all the bones and see what the animal actually looked like. We actually, in the Kemkem, only get fragmentary uh, material that's often broken and not associated, so it's quite difficult to tell what uh, these animals look like and what bones actually belong to what animal. So I'm just going to run through a few examples here of some of the material that we get. We have a scapulocoracoid, so part of the shoulder, a neck vertebra, also known as a cervical vertebra, uh, a humerus, so an upper arm bone, an upper leg bone called the femur, and here we have two uh, jaw fragments. Uh, the upper jaw of Afrotapijara, as you can see, has got a downturn, and the upper jaw of a lanka. Now, this, uh, as you can see, a Lankers is uh, quite straight and has got this bony protuberance towards the back. That's that little the divot that sticks uh, down. Uh, these two jaws are from around the same position in the, in the skull, but are drastically different in their morphology. And that's how we distinguish between all the pterosaurs in the Kemkem. Uh, they're all described based on jaw fragments. And that's because each of these animals has a different diet, uh, has a different feeding style, and therefore that's reflected in its jaw morphology. Now, in the Kemkem, we have some pterosaur uh, paleontological uh, mysteries. Now, before everyone says, do you have two-headed monster pterosaurs in the Kim Kim? No, we don't. This is just a diagram that shows the abundance of each of the bones uh, that we have, um, with red being incredibly abundant and uh, pale green being low abundance with white a complete absence. Now, for some unknown reason, we're not quite sure, uh, as darkoid toothless jaw fragments are incredibly common in the Kemkem, comprising about 50% of the material. Now, one pterosaur should have and does have two uh, jaws, an upper jaw and a lower jaw. Now, if we compare that to neck vertebrae, cervical vertebrae, there are eight in a pterosaur. So it should be eight to two, so cervical vertebrae should be far more common. Now, that's not the case. 50% uh, asdarkoid jaw fragments opposed to less than 10% cervical vertebra. So why that might be? Now, we're not quite sure, but we also have other mysteries like a complete lack of carpals. These are wrist bones. They're incredibly strong, incredibly durable, and should survive. Now, this could be to do with uh, predation, where a predator like a large dinosaur or a crocodile grabs the pterosaur by the head, bites off the beak because it's not very tasty, there's not much meat on the, uh, on the beak, uh, and that's why that's preserved, and perhaps uh, it spits out some of the uh, wing bones because, again, there isn't much meat on a pterosaur wing. It also could be to do with uh, transportation in the river, with certain um, bones being uh, sorted or spread apart. Now, as I mentioned, leptostomia uh, is a, we think is a pro-feeding pterosaur. It's 
jaws, we don't have that much of them. And we only have a little bit of the upper jaw and a little bit of the lower jaw are incredibly slender and incredibly long. Now, that's quite similar to some probe feeding birds today, like the kiwi. And we actually nicknamed Lepistomia kiwi dactylus when we first found it. It's also similar to some shoreline birds like the godwit. But as well as having this morphological similarity, we also have uh, these small holes on the jaws, which are called foramina. And that's where a nerve uh, might, uh, came through the bone uh, to the surface. And that was used for sensing. Now, these are found in quite a lot of pro feeding birds, including the woodcock. They're a different shape in the woodcock, as you can see here. But essentially, they do the same purpose. And what we think Lepistomia was doing was pushing its beak into the uh, soft sediment um, on the river banks or on the floodplains and sensing for food without actually seeing or feeling it um, and probably fed on worms and crustaceans. Now, we don't think Leptostomia was a very large pterosaur, probably only about two meter wingspan, but we did have some absolute giants in the Kim Kim. Now, this is an outline of an albatross. It's the bird around today, which has the largest wingspan of about 3.3 meters, um, but we have pterosaurs in the Kim Kim that dwarf it up to eight meter wingspan. Now I'll show you a couple of the bones of these. On the left we have a femur. Now this femur is larger than our femur and on the right we have a cervical vertebra from one of those toothless pterosaurs that I mentioned, probably a lanka, uh, with a neck probably longer than a giraffe. So these are absolutely massive animals. Now, as well as these giants, we also have their flaplings. Now, these are the hatchlings, the, the young individuals. We don't have that much of these animals. We only have a few jaw fragments. Uh, but as you can see, they're very small, probably only a, uh, a, uh, from an individual with a one meter, perhaps as small as a half a meter wingspan. And these jaws are incredibly small, only a few centimeters long and probably are from individuals that died uh, not long after hatching, which is incredibly sad, but incredibly interesting as well. Now, if we compare those to these giants, you can see from a half a meter wingspan uh, up to an eight meter wingspan is a massive uh, growth range. And we have this for both a Pateranthus and a Lanka. Now, this is even more interesting uh, when we think that these pterosaurs uh, were precocial um, and could actually fly as soon as they hatched from the egg. So the Chem Chem group pterosaur material is incredibly important despite its fragmentary nature. It demonstrates that the Chem Chem River had, it, had a diverse uh, assemblage of at least nine pterosaur species, all living alongside each other, each likely occupying different ecological niches and therefore having a different diet and feeding style, resulting in subtle differences in their jaws. And that's how I mentioned earlier, that's how we distinguish between these animals. It also shows us that both giants and their flaplings uh, lived alongside each other as well and probably occupied different ecological niches. Now we hope to build on this research in the future, and hopefully we can unravel some of these mysteries and solve uh, the mystery of why we have no carpals and an abundance of jaw fragments. Thank you for listening. And uh, I'll go back to Carl, who will ask some questions, I presume. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Roy. Uh, it just goes to show that pterosaurs simply aren't just the flappy things that are in a picture book, in a dinosaur book. They are way more unique than that. But... Can we get a round of applause in the comments section for Roy? And now we've finished with all our speakers. Uh, one thing I can say is uh, to steal a line from Roy Schneider, I think we need a bigger vote. But we're going to now move into the Q&A section of our video, and we're going to try and get to as many questions as we can for each of our speakers. So let's get into it. Let's get our other two speakers back, and we'll get into a Q&A. Welcome back, gentlemen, and hopefully we should get our first question. And we do. It's from Dylan. Why is the age of the strata of the Chem Chem group not that accurate? Has it just been researched? Uh, has it not been researched yet, or are the methods not reliable? Uh, um, that's a very, very good question. Very good question. So the Chem Chem group, we have a very, very good age for, if you like, as young as it could possibly be. There are some very, very characteristic ammonites found in the Acrobu formation uh, that are found very widely across the Mediterranean region, North Africa and over to the Middle East. Um, and 
they date the limestones very securely at um, Upper Sanamanian. Now, there is a lot of limestone below these ammonites, and then you come into the Chemchem group, and you go right down through the Chemchem group, Alfus formation, and then you come to the, the FS1 formation with all of the bones in. And that's a lot of strata, so there's a lot of time there. We also know that there's a massively uh, sharp change in lithology and a disconformity between the Akrabu formation and the Chemchem group. And so there is some time missing there. Now, the real problem is that the sediments of the Chemchem group are highly oxidized and they no longer have any polynomorphs in them. That's fossil spores and pollen, which can be used for dating what we would call continental deposits. They also lack any marine organisms because they're river deposits. And the vertebrates are not well known enough to have precise stratigraphic ranges that we can use them to date them. And the other complication is that at the bottom of the Chemchem group, the strata that they sit on in the south of the Tafilalt region are really ancient Paleozoic strata, and there's a big unconformity there. So that would bracket them as somewhere between the Cenomanian and the Carboniferous, and that's an appalling level of resolution. If you go to the northern Tafilalt, there actually are some younger strata than the Carboniferous, uh, the Paleozoic, underneath the Chemchem, and they are late Jurassic. So we know that the Chemchem group is not Jurassic, and we know that it is no younger than Upper Cenomanian. If we then compare with faunas elsewhere, there are similarities with fossils in Brazil, within Egypt, and those basins, those sedimentary basins, they all have their own problems in dating, but they certainly are around about that boundary between the early Cretaceous and the late Cretaceous. And presently, we're actually doing several techniques trying to refine the dating of these deposits. Right, I thank hope you that very answers much. Answers your question. Yep, yeah, I, I think that answers the question. Yeah, you went into some great detail there. Um, and we'll get our next question up and we'll see who can answer this question. Ah, here we go. This one's from Simon. Do the adaptations of spinosaurs indicate towards a certain type of behavior, such as a more active uh, endothermic organism like an otter or an ambush style ectothermic organism, such as a crocodilian? So I think, uh, Nizar, you can answer this question. Sure. Uh, it's a very good question. It's, uh, it's also a difficult one to answer. Um, generally speaking, we know the dinosaurs were more um, active and, uh, you know, more bird or mammal-like in many cases than, say, you know, quote-unquote, typical reptiles that you see, that you see today. Um, in the case of Spinosaurus, I think you were also dealing with a very large animal. Spinosaurus was 15 meters long and may have weighed uh, over 10 tons. So this was a really, really large animal. Um, so an ambush style uh, predation approach is certainly not something I would rule out. Um, but it was a, a, an active animal. It was certainly not very crocodilian in many other aspects of its anatomy. As you know, dinosaurs do not have a sprawling gait and, and so on. Um, but um, it's hard to tell. We are, really, we are tr currently trying to model um, aquatic locomotion in Spinosaurus in a lot more detail. We're building sophisticated, sophisticated three-dimensional models um, of Spinosaurus to see how exactly this animal would swim through the water, how fast. Um, one thing to remember about Spinosaurus, though, is that some of these fish, as you know from the, the previous talk, uh, were really, really big, right? So, you know, catching one of these giant SUV-sized coelacanths, for example, is not quite as challenging as hunting, you know, fast-moving smaller fish. So it's a little bit like with T-Rex, you know, T-Rex was not a particularly fast runner, but it was fast enough to catch a Triceratops or a, you know, Ankylosaur or something. So, um, so I guess, you know, it's something we're still trying to figure out, but I would err on the side of, you know, it was a more active predator um, and, you know, would certainly have been able to go after some of these fish. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, great detail again, and I hope that answers Simon's question. Um, and we'll get our next question up. And this one is from uh, Barkita. So, so I've be, I've seen many vertebrate fossils that have been recovered from this environment. Are there any notable invertebrate fossils that have been found there? 
<laughs> a good question. Um, I don't know whether there are any that are notable. Um, invertebrate fossils are incredibly rare there. Um, mostly invertebrates, if they have a shell to be preserved, it's usually made of calcite or aragonite, calcium carbonate. And unfortunately, the chemchem -chem strata are very, very porous. Water has flowed through them for, well, since the Cretaceous at least, uh, and the vast majority of invertebrates um, have been dissolved. They've, they've, they're gone. But for some reason, the, the water wasn't sufficiently added, acid to dissolve away the bones. So bones are incredibly well preserved, even if you look at them under the electron microscope. They're beautifully preserved. But the invertebrates, when we find them, are actually grotty. Uh, but when we find them, uh, we actually we, we home in on them, we collect them because they're so rare that they're important to, to, to be able to document what was there but has now gone. Um, and the one thing that we keep finding are freshwater bivalves, unionid bivalves, freshwater mussels. And we do find a few snails, a few gastropods, but they're in the higher beds. Um, and the other thing that we find are simply the traces and the burrows of invertebrates. Um, but it would be really nice if we could find a, a few more substantial invertebrate remains. Uh, they are very rare there. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Artsil, and I, I hope that's uh, answered Barkey's questions. So uh, we'll get our next question up and we'll see who else can answer it. Anytime soon, hopefully. Here we go. Uh, this is from Loz P. Have you ever recovered a complete specimen? I'd imagine it would be a rare event in a floodplain environment. Right. Um, a complete, I don't think, uh, nobody ever finds a complete specimen. Uh, you know, even if you find a partially articulate, our Spinosaurus that uh, uh, Nizar was describing, uh, there's still either a lot more still to be found or, or quite a lot that got dragged away by the Cretaceous equivalent of a hyena. Um, but there are some articulated specimens. The fossil diggers do come across occasionally a fossil fish, which has got a complete skull and maybe part of its body with all of its scales. And I have seen crocodiles that have been nearly complete. Um, what Roy is hoping for <laughs> is a, a complete skull of a pterosaur. So far, we haven't even found out of all the hundreds of bones we've seen, we haven't even found the back part of a skull. Um, so there are some odd things going on. But right. we do occasionally find nearly nearly complete fishes. Yeah, I was going to say there's one, one locality in particular that preserves some beautiful fish specimens, uh, the Umtkut locality. And uh, those are you know largely complete uh, with some beautiful soft tissue preservation. This has been interpreted as a pond locality. So it's a, a kind of a very specific setting. Yeah. Um, it's, so it's, at, it's atypical, isn't it? Yeah, so this is it's, this not, it's, of, it's atypical for Ken it's, Ken. A, it's a very rare kind of occurrence. Um, but this is one place where you kind of get a, a little glimpse into, um, you know, soft tissue preservation and so on in Chem Chem taxa. All right, thank you, uh, both of you. I hope that answers uh, Los P's question, and hopefully, in the future, we should find a complete specimen uh, of anything, hopefully. Um, we've got our next, uh, next question coming from Cole Francis. Since the pterosaurs only have one extended finger supporting their wing membranes, what effect did these have on them? Uh, would they have not been able to fly for as long? So I guess this is a question for Roy. That's a good one. That is a good one. So although the, although the wing finger uh, was... The, the anterior spar of the wing. Sorry, my internet's playing up. Um, the, um, the, 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 the legs were involved and uh, the wing membrane attached to somewhere on the, on the hind limb, possibly down at the ankle. Uh, and that meant that the pterosaur could change the shape of its wing uh, and give it more support by using not only the, its arms, but also its legs as well. And the sheer size of these animals would suggest that they could stay up in the air for quite a long time without using very much energy. So um, I think that, that the arm is going to be supported more by the, by the air underneath it than it is by the muscles holding the wing out. Would you say, Roy, would you, would you think that's uh, reasonable? 
Yeah, uh, I'd, agree, I'd agree completely. Yeah, I can't, I can't imagine them uh, not being able to fly for as long. Um, I, I can imagine them, them being absolutely amazing flyers, uh, likely better than a lot of birds today. Uh, it's a, it, it took 160 million years to evolve this sort of um, uh, this this uh, type of flight. You know, it's um, it's something which obviously worked really well because the animals were around for such a long time, um, longer than. Um, bats have been around today and like and longer than birds that have been around as well all right thank you too um hopefully that's answered cole's question uh, definitely a lot of detail and it shows how incredible pterosaurs are and just how weird they are as well uh we'll get into our next question which is from estamenosuchus um after the marine transgression at the base of the Akrabu, are there any chironian age freshwater deposits in morocco so that, that is a good question. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, the the that marine transgression um, gave rise to limestones that persisted all the way through the Turonian. So not very far north of the Tafilout, uh, there is a beautiful place called Asfla near Gulmima, and the Turonian limestones there are full of ammonites, fishes. And actually, for you people who are listening, uh, Kyle is actually working on some marine reptiles from that Turonian level. And if you follow the sequence higher up still in the Cretaceous, it does indeed go back into red beds. There is a regression, and the latest Cretaceous in Morocco is represented by red beds. They're over to the east of the country, south of a town called Oujda uh, and north of a, a, a town called Anwal. And somewhere in that huge, huge wilderness between those two places, there are sedimentary basins with late Cretaceous strata that are non-marine. But they are younger than Chironian. They're likely to be Campanian and Maastrichtian. All right, brilliant. Thank you very much, Dave. Um... And I hope that's answered Estimena Sukas's question. And we'll get into our next question. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes left, so let's try and get through some more questions. And this one is from Kirsty. How many types of crocodiliforms have been found in the Chem Chem region, and have there been any new findings recently? That's I think this a, is from Nizar. Um, this is this is one for yeah. Nizar. That's a very good question. Um, it was a really diverse croc assemblage. And we've got crocs in all shapes and sizes. We've got one croc with a really flat skull. We've got short snouted ones. We've got small ones that would be moving around on land, kind of like a cross between a little dog and a croc. Um, and we've got really big ones. We have some jaw pieces of very, very large crocs um, with a body length of 10 meters or more. Um, so, but the exact number of crocs is difficult to establish because many times we just have, you know, uh, skull fragments, um, and so we, we're looking at the dentition, we're looking at some telltale signs in the skulls. Um, the last time we, we counted, we had, you know, seven or eight different types of crocs at least, um, but we keep adding new ones, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to tell you something that's, that's, you know, it's a project that's still in the pipeline. We've got a couple of really beautiful croc specimens uh, we're working on at the moment, and so we are going to add to the diversity of the chem chem crocs um so yeah we keep finding new ones several specimens are under study um so this was clearly a great place for crocodiliforms all right brilliant thank you Nizar. um and i hope that's answered Kirsty's question i think we have time for at least one or maybe two questions so let's get into our possibly final question uh and this one if i could ask something would pterosaurs be able to glide on air currents like vultures and condors do? So this is a question for Roy and uh, Professor Martel, I believe. I think yes, yes, yes. yes, most definitely. Yes. Um, Absolutely, yes. So yeah, most most definitely. With wings as big as that, and they had tiny bodies. They really had tiny bodies. So, uh, and although their heads were large, there wasn't very much weight in their in their heads. Uh, so. Realistically, they they hadn't got much weight to carry. Uh, once the wings were open and the wing membrane stretched out, they could probably glide mm -hmm. very very far on very gentle air currents and thermals, 
uh, they they often had a broad wing aspect, so um, they could probably perform as well as Andy and Condors, if not better. All right, brilliant. Um, I, I hope that answers uh, that person's question. Um, and I think maybe we have one more t uh, one more question. Or yep, yeah, we do. This is from Dino Boy O Six Six. Uh, why is there such a low number of herbivorous specimens in the Chem Chem group? That's yeah, well, that, that, is, that is an excellent <laughs> question. That is. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you know people have suggested in the past that maybe um, this is a, a collecting bias. Maybe it's just that you know the scientists out there and the local collectors are just picking up bones of predatory dinosaurs. Uh, but I can tell you that is definitely not the case. Um, we collect everything we can find, and we would love to find, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, a large ornithopod dinosaur, right? We found some remains of large plant-eating dinosaurs, sauropods, uh, but we collect everything we find. Um, and same thing for the local collectors. And, and in fact, if they find a femur of, uh, you know, a predatory dinosaur, it really doesn't look that different from a femur of a, you know, herbivorous dinosaur. So that's, it's clearly not a collecting bias. Um, the other question is, could it be a taphonomic bias? Is it something about the environment that just, you know, ensures that these types of fossils do not preserve? But again, if you look at the size and morphology of, say, the leg bones, there's no reason why it would preferentially, you know, the environment would preferentially preserve leg bones of predatory dinosaurs and not of, of certain herbivorous dinosaurs. And interestingly, we see the same thing all across the Sahara. So if you go to Egypt or um, Algeria, all of these places, you see the same pattern. So it's a very large scale bias, um, if it is a bias. Um, so I think that's quite unlikely because the depositional settings are quite different. So it's a really interesting question. We have lots and lots of predators, as I mentioned, um, and many of them relied on fish as a food source. So it was kind of a food web based on the fish. That was the one abundant food source. One thing I could imagine is that maybe this particular kind of um, near shore environment was just not very good at supporting large plant eating animals. But if you go further inland, so to speak, maybe uh, you get a different picture, right? And you get more plant-eating dinosaurs. Um, so maybe it's just the part of the river system um, that we're sampling that kind of, you know, shows us this, this picture. And if you go further inland, it might look different. Um, and I should add that when it comes to vegetation, we also don't really find a lot of um, uh, clues telling us that this was a great place for animals that needed to, to process a huge amount of vegetation. Yeah, the thing is, of course, is that the sauropods were very large animals, and we we have evidence that there were really immense sauropods uh, in that setting, and that's also another story which we're going to reveal uh, in the very near future. But one of the things that Nizar uh, commented there was about the fact that herbivores might have been living further up country, and in fact, if you go to Niger in rocks that are just a little bit older then ornithopod dinosaurs such as Uranosaurus uh, did live down there. So I think Nizar's idea that maybe the environment didn't suit ornithopods is, is very, very valid. But what we would still have to explain is how did it support sauropods, which are, they're not the, they're not the commonest of fossils there, but equally they're not the rarest either in the mm -hmm. chem, chem There are lots and lots of mysteries, and that's a really good reason for working on the chem, chem for another 30 or 40 years, if not longer. Right, I think uh, we've just about finished uh, with the questions. So thank you very much, all of you, for answering the questions. And thank you very much, everyone, for asking the questions. And could we just get a quick round of applause in the comment section for all our speakers tonight? And thank you for tuning in. And I hope you've enjoyed. And again, go to that feedback form. And we should, well, hopefully we've, you've enjoyed it. And we'll hopefully see you next year. So thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Heard about PCR Biosystems? There's quite a buzz about us. Hop on over to our website to find out more.